we're going to continue now trying to put together this idea of the thermal wind relationship, which is a gentle way of saying the thermal wind equation. The thermal wind equation has symbols from scary math classes like partial differential equations. You don't want to see it, okay? Um, but we're going to be saying that this thermal wind relationship is going to be explaining why we have a mid-latitude jet stream and where it's actually happening. And we're going to be applying this idea that we've so far discussed in part one, which is about the thickness of layers of the atmosphere. And we're going to apply them to what's going along on along a polar front. Remember, a polar front is a place where cold air masses from the north and warm air masses from the south are meeting, where there is a temperature gradient to throw out a term we've had earlier in the course, as in temperatures are changing horizontally. You go from one location to another and you encounter a new temperature. Let me give you a little hint here. Make sure you have this idea of polar front down when you take uh, the test in this module. But now just to be clear, the, the thermal wind relationship and the thermal wind equation actually applies anywhere there's a horizontal temperature gradient. We're applying this equation in the context of the polar front, where there's a cold side and a warm side, but actually this would work anywhere. Um, in my tropical meteorology class, we apply it uh, on the margins of the Sahara Desert, where there's a boundary between cooler jungles to the south and this blazingly hot desert to the north. Okay, there's a temperature gradient there, and the thermal wind relationship is going to be explaining why certain wind features happen. Um, it is warmer in the center of a hurricane than on the edges of a hurricane, and part of the story of how winds change with respect to height in a hurricane is about the thermal wind relationship. Okay? Um, anytime you have a horizontal temperature gradient, the thermal wind relationship is going to apply. We're just doing it in a particular context. And so that context that we're going to be doing is, of course, in the, in the sense of the polar front. And we're going to be building kind of a cross-section here of the atmosphere. Uh, now, I've got it drawn so that the left-hand side of the diagram here is to the north, and the south uh, is the right side of the diagram here. And I'm going to say that it is cold over on the north side, and it is warm in the south side. We're going to go ahead and say that this is like the northern hemisphere or something like that. But again, I mean, in fact, the... Cold and the north and the south thing is actually kind of arbitrary. It's really the cold side and the warm side that matters. But to help you picture this or whatever. Now, let's say we've got some kind of cold air coming from the north. Probably, to put this in the context of our general circulation module in our class right now, that would probably be cold air that's coming off of like the polar high up near the North Pole or something like that. And so down near the surface, those air masses, remember, are at the surface. We are bringing this cold air uh, from the north down towards the south. And at some place along the way, it will meet warm air masses coming from the south off of tropical source regions like, you know, the Gulf of Mexico or whatever. There will be some place where air coming off of the subtropical highs at about 30 degrees north will be very warm and will be encountering the cold air from the, from the, from the north. And near the surface of the Earth, we call that boundary between those two types of air masses a polar front. We talked about that even in the general circulation lecture. Now, you may or may not have already watched the lectures or done the readings or whatever that says, hey, that could be a cold front, that could be a warm front, that could be a stationary front. That's what those are, though. Okay, They are the boundary between cold air from the north meeting warm air from the south correct term for them in general is that they're a polar front. Now, what we let's take this idea that we clearly now have a cold side and a warm side to our polar front and apply what we know about thickness to the two sides of that uh, front. So, for example, let's take the warm side first. If you were to launch a weather balloon on the warm side or you were to take an instrumented aircraft and fly up on the warm side, you would at some point encounter the 500 millibar level, you know, the place where five, the pressure is 500 millibars, or the 400 millibar level where the pressure is now 400 millibars. And because we know we're on the warm side of the front, and the average temperature between, say, 500 millibars in the ground is quite high, then there's a lot of, the, the thickness of the, say, 1,000 millibar to 500 millibar level is going to be quite great. 500 millibars is going to be pretty darn far above the ground on the warm side of our polar front. And same with 400 millibars. 400 millibars will be pushed higher above the ground because of the 
great thickness of the layers below it and so on. It's 500 millibars, 400 millibars, any given pressure level we chose up there in the middle and upper troposphere would be pretty darn high above the ground. Well, what about on the cold side? On the cold side, the thickness of layers is less because the average temperature of these layers is less. The front, the cold air mass is actually at the ground, but the average temperature of the layer between near the surface, like a thousand millibars and say 500 millibars, the average temperature of that layer is not very high at all. The thickness of that layer will be less. So 500 millibars is going to be closer to the ground on the cold side than it is on the warm side. And for that matter, a 400 millibars will be closer to the ground than, uh, than on the cold side than it was on the warm side. If for no other reason, then, well, you know, the bottom, you know, it's 500 millibars got close to the ground and it took 400 millibars with it. It's like a stack, right? Uh, if we make the layer between 1,000 and 500 millibars less thick, all the layers above it get closer to the ground too, okay? So on the cold side, these isobaric levels like 500 millibars and 400 millibars are pretty close to the ground. And on the warm side, they're pretty far above the ground. And between them, right in the vicinity of the polar front itself, but above the polar front, those pressure, those the thicknesses of those layers are going to have to change pretty quickly. And therefore, the height of those isobaric levels are going to have to change very quickly. On the warm side, 500 millibars is way high above the ground. On the cold side, 500 millibars is not that high above the ground. And right near the polar front itself, but above the polar front, the height of the 500 millibar surface has to change pretty quickly. And the same is true of 400 millibars or 300 millibars or whatever. Any place in the upper troposphere, it's going to be just changing very quickly. Now, let's think about what that means for the pressure gradient force aloft. Again, we're talking like middle and upper troposphere here, not down at the surface down where the polar front is, but above it where all this change is happening, where these rapid changes in the heights of these isobaric levels are happening. And to help understand this, I'm going to draw a little line here between the cold side and the warm side. I'll label it one end of that little line segment A and on this cross section and the other one B. And let's just come up with some ballpark estimate as to what the pressure should be. Notice I draw that line horizontally there, okay? A and B are the same number of meters above the ground, but they don't necessarily have the same pressure. I mean, if we think for a moment about the pressure at that point A, well, that point A is farther above the ground than 400 millibars is, right? I mean, we can see that point A is clearly far more meters above the ground than the 400 millibar surface is. Well, since pressure always decreases with respect to height, we therefore know that at that location A, the pressure has to be less than 400 millibars. And just for the sake of like a thought problem here, let's make it 300 millibars. Let's say that at that pressure there is 300 millibars. Okay, whatever. All right, let's play the same game with point B. Again, point B is the same number of meters above the ground as point A, but it's on the warm side of the polar front. Now, when I look at this diagram here, what I see is that B is closer to the ground than the 500 millibar surface is. 500 millibars on the warm side is higher than B. So the pressure at B has to be more than 500 millibars since, you know, pressure always decreases, uh, increases as you get closer to the ground. All right, for the sake of our thought problem here, let's take a uh, pressure of 600 millibars. All right. It doesn't really matter. Now, again, these are purely arbitrary. We could have chosen other heights of the atmosphere. We could have moved this line from A to B up and down. We could have drawn more. Uh, you know, we could have drawn the 300 millibar surface and the 200 millibar surface, but we would have gotten the same result. At a given height, we have two very different pressures on the cold side versus the warm side of the uh, of the polar front. In fact, that's not. I mean, that's a pressure gradient. More importantly, that's a huge pressure gradient. We have changed, in this case, across that relatively short distance there, we've changed the pressure like 300 millibars. Okay, that's a very, very large pressure difference. Remember when you looked at maps of pressure in like the, earlier in this textbook or uh, maybe back in the ATS-114 lab, you know, the whole range of pressures on that map might have only been 15, 20 millibars. Here we have a range of like 300 millibars. This is a very, very large pressure gradient, which means that there is a very large pressure gradient force. The pressure gradient force 
always pushes from higher pressure towards lower pressure. And the strength of the pressure gradient force is about how big that pressure gradient is, how big the difference in the pressure is. Well, gosh, that's a huge pressure difference. So that's a huge pressure gradient force. There's an enormous pressure gradient force acting on air parcels, pushing them from the warm side to the cold side. Now, I'm not saying that the air parcels are going to move from the warm side to the cold side. I'm saying that there's a giant force acting on them, pushing towards from the warm side to the cold side. Look where that force is happening. It is pushing them from the cold side, to, I'm sorry, from the warm side to the cold side, and it's happening above the polar front. Not at the surface, above the polar front, up in the, the middle and upper troposphere. And it is pretty much only right there above the polar front. If we did the same kind of analysis, like say over the cold air mass, we wouldn't have gotten such a big pressure gradient force. If we had done the same thing over the warm air mass, we wouldn't have gotten such a uh, big pressure gradient. It's only because of that big change in the heights of those pressure surfaces right above the polar front that this worked. Oh, let's, let's, that's just, it's worth spending a moment on that. There is a very strong pressure gradient force then acting aloft, in other words, not at the surface, but like in the middle and upper troposphere, and it is directly above the polar front, and it is pushing towards the north. Well, in the northern hemisphere, it's pushing toward the north. A more general answer is it's pushing toward the cold side. It is any place that there's going to be a temperature gradient, like there was a temperature gradient at the surface associated with the polar front there, it's now pushing in, the cold air, uh, sorry, the pressure gradient force is pushing toward the cold air. That is a huge, important understanding in meteorology. Now let's think about what that actually means then for the jet, in particular the mid-latitude jet stream. Remember, we've also talked about like the subtropical jet stream. The subtropical jet stream is not exactly a thermal wind relationship thing. Okay, this is a better explanation of the mid-latitude jet stream. So let's ask about how this could actually happen. How does this cause a mid-latitude jet stream? Okay, now I'm being a little bit bad about PowerPoint here. Let me see if I can help you see what's going on here. I've got a map here. And see that purple line I drew on the map? Let's say that purple line is a polar front at the surface. Okay, that purple line is at the surface. Later we'll see this with some perspective that might help. Um, that purple line is a boundary between a cold air mass on the north side of it and a warm air mass on the south side of it. It could be a cold front, it could be a warm front, it could be a stationary front. Um, I don't care, okay? Fronts are not drawn as a purple line. I'm deliberately drawing it stupidly so that later when you learn about cold fronts and warm fronts and you learn about the right symbols and so on, you're not distracted by that. At the same time here, I've put some little blue circles on there. Those blue circles on there are air parcels. I'm saying, hey, I got little volumes of air here that are above the polar front. Again, in a future slide, you'll see it where it's drawn with some perspective. Those air parcels that I have drawn there are supposed to be not at the polar front, they're supposed to be above it. Okay, again, with perspective, it'll be more clear. So think of those air parcels as being, you know, maybe a few kilometers above the ground. There's a polar front, that boundary between cold air and warm air at the surface, and those air parcels are supposed to be, you know, five, six kilometers up above the ground. Now, we have already then, from our earlier part of this discussion, where we saw the cross section uh, from north to south here, we now understand that each and every one of those air parcels has a pressure gradient force acting on it. A, in fact, astonishingly strong pressure gradient force acting on it. And that pressure gradient force is pushing from the warm side to the cold side. Doesn't necessarily mean, it doesn't actually end up meaning that the air parcels are going to go from the warm side to the cold side. I'm saying there's a big force on them, pushing them from the warm side to the cold side. All right, so I drew that on there. I've got all those little arrows on there. Do, 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 do. Each air parcel is experiencing a big old pressure gradient force pushing it from the warm side to the cold side. But I told you, this is like the upper, middle and upper troposphere. We're talking five, six, seven, eight kilometers above the ground. Well, then we don't need to worry about friction anywhere up there or anything like that. We can go ahead and say these winds are going to be geostrophic. Ah, oh, throwing that geostrophic word again from an earlier module. Yes, I am. What did we know about geostrophic winds from that earlier module? Well, one of the things we knew about them is that if these winds are geostrophic, we know that we're going to end up having two forces in balance with each other. 
uh, our pressure gradient force on an air parcel will be exactly matched by a equally strong but opposite Coriolis force. So even though I don't yet have the whole story figured out here, I know if I've got a big strong pressure gradient force one way, I've got to have a big strong Coriolis force in exactly the opposite direction. Okay? So if I have a big strong pressure gradient force one way and a big strong Coriolis force the other, how do I get that big strong Coriolis force? I mean, I know it's got to be there because these winds are going to be geostrophic. How do you get it? Well, you get a big strong Coriolis force by having a big strong wind. Remember, the strength of the Coriolis force is determined largely by the strength of the wind. So in order to have a big strong Coriolis force, you're going to have to have a big strong wind. Okay, let's see, that Coriolis force needs to be 90 degrees to the right of the wind. So if my Coriolis force is pointing towards the south, that means my wind has to be out of the west. And I have that big arrow drawn on there. I apparently have these air parcels moving off from the west to the east. I have a big strong west wind. And again, remember, where is all this happening? In the middle and upper troposphere, directly above a polar front. My thermal wind relationship gave me a way to connect what's going on with regard to temperatures at the surface, in terms of like their horizontal pattern, their horizontal temperature gradient, to explain why there's a strong jet stream sitting up above it. That's really wild. It's an amazing thing. Once, when I, when I was an atmospheric science student, I didn't really get it. I was like, I don't understand why this is so important. But when you think about it, it's an astonishingly wonderful and amazing thing. Horizontal temperature patterns cause the winds to change with respect to height. And in this case, the big strong temperature differences along a front give rise to a very strong wind up in the upper troposphere. It's huge. That is our polar front. Let's try to do this with a little bit of perspective. I admit that I did this all in Microsoft Paint, so it's not exactly uh, brilliant how I illustrated this here. But again, that purple line is supposed to be um, my polar front at the surface. It's got cold air from the north coming in off Canada and so on. And I got warm air coming from the south over here, okay? Um, it's this boundary between these two cold air masses and so on. And what the thermal wind relationship tells us is that up above that, because of changes in thickness on the two sides of the polar front, we set up pressure gradient forces aloft, which, because the winds are geostrophic, means that we have to have an equal but opposite Coriolis force, and each of those little air parcels, therefore, has to be shooting off, in this case, to the from the west to the east. This is our mid-latitude jet stream. That is huge. I like that diagram, by the way. For, for, for Microsoft Paint, I think I did pretty well. All right, each of those air parcels has two huge forces on it. They're canceling each other out, but to get that big, strong Coriolis force, we had to have a big, strong wind out of the west, and we end up with our mid-latitude jet stream. This is a huge revelation. This is such an important thing. Allow me to be pedantic for a moment here. Pedantic as in teacherly or annoying or uh, annoyingly teacherly. A person with excessively a person who is excessively concerned with minor details or with displaying technical knowledge. Strictly speaking, what I'm showing you here is not exact. It's more an application of the thermal wind equation. What the thermal wind equation would be telling us is that winds change with respect to height any time there's a horizontal temperature gradient. Now. And this was a brilliant example of that. I mean, we had this big horizontal temperature gradient. I mean, there was a big difference between the temperature on the south side and the north side of this polar front. Horizontal temperature gradient, we definitely got it here. And therefore, we ended up with a big change in the winds with respect to height. Winds go from relatively weakish at the surface to just roaring aloft at, you know, like the 300 millibar level or something like that in the upper middle and upper troposphere. That's huge. And it would have worked any place we had the horizontal temperature gradient. I gave you the example of the Sahara Desert. I gave you the example of hurricanes. Any place winds change with respect to height, your first thought should be thermal wind equation. This just happens to be our best example in this class of how the thermal wind equation applies. So just to sort of summarize what's going on here, if we had to put this little story together, the mid-latitude jet stream is found directly above the polar front, with cold air to the left of its flow. And this is because of changes in the thickness on the cold side and the warm side 
of the pressure of the polar front at the surface. Those changes in thickness cause changes in the heights of different pressure surfaces, and those changes in heights cause pressure gradient forces that had to be balanced due to the geostrophic wind by big Coriolis forces. And the only way you got those big Coriolis forces was by having that ragingly fast wind aloft, the mid-latitude jet stream. This whole story is neatly described in a 500 level math class kind of way by the thermal wind equation, but the story of it, how we put it together as a thought problem is called the thermal wind relationship. Cool. Now, that being said, it's easy to misunderstand what this is all about. Don't try to tell me that like the warm side of the front is high pressure and the cold side of the front is low pressure. No, actually at the at the surface there might be high pressure, there might be low pressure. In fact, the air masses tend to be high pressure. Um, if you wanted to tell me that aloft that was true at like the 500 millibar surface or at the 400 millibar surface, well those levels, I mean, they are a pressure level. The 500 millibar level is 500 millibars. It's not high pressure or low pressure, it is 500 millibars. So that first bulleted point there, that just never really works, okay? Similarly, don't try to tell me that air flows from the warm side of the polar front to the cold side of the front. No, no, it doesn't. There's a heat pressure gradient force trying to make that happen. Pressing from the high, uh, aloft at like, five, at like um, you know, several kilometers above the ground, there's a very strong pressure gradient force trying to push air from the warm side to the cold side, but it won't happen because the flow is geostrophic at those levels. And therefore, that very strong pressure gradient force is going to be perfectly balanced by an equally strong but opposite Coriolis force. Oh, thermal wind relationship is huge. I torture graduate students with this about tons of things. I torture, torture upper class of Indian atmospheric science classes about this, and applications of this, and so on all the time. It's a very important understanding in atmospheric sciences. We are applying it to one particular problem. Why is there a mid-latitude jet stream sitting right above the polar front? All right. Oh, well, heck, I just practically gave that question away from you, for you. Question four. We would expect to find a mid-latitude jet stream blank a polar front. To the south of, to the north of, to the east of, to the west of, directly above or directly below. Which of those describes where we find a mid-latitude jet stream with respect to the polar front? Make a choice from those six options and get a little feedback before you move on to question five.